Well, you know, this is uh, this is uh, old friends meet new friends. In fact, uh, I can't tell you how coincidental and then running into each other were really great for this panel to come together. Um, so I'll let the panelists introduce themselves. Uh, they have got phenomenal stories to tell. I mean, you already heard from Dr. Dantu, but uh, this is a this is a fresh panel. So, Chandana, take it away. Thank you. Thank you so much. My name is Chandana Mahadeshwara Swami. Yes, my name comes very encrypted. <laughs> um, I could use it as a password. Um, uh, I'm. I'm from LaGuardia Community College. I'm the Senior Director for Career and Professional Programs. Um, I oversee workforce initiatives um, within the non-credit programming, including the Cyber NYC that my colleague Seema was referring, uh, referencing to earlier. Uh, uh, this is Ram Dine, too. Um, my, I have my, in my previous life, I worked around 15 years in the industry. Uh, working with uh, Cisco Systems um, because I got uh, I was working for a startup company acquired by Cisco. So I went there, then I went to another startup acquired by Audio Course, then I got another startup acquired by uh, Wire. So anyway, I landed up in the, finally in uh, university. I'm, I'm a professor actually right now, and um, for the last uh, 15 years there, and I manage uh, I act like the director of a Center for Cyber Security. I, and I have, a, I also run a network security lab where I run 15 PhD students and I teach courses uh, in cyber security, mostly network security and, um, and other courses. Um, we have uh, in the University of North Texas, we have BS, uh, we are pro proposing a BS in cyber security as well as MS in cyber security. Uh, and I run also another program called SFS, Scholarship for Service, where you can actually do PhD, and we actually, the government pays you after that. Um, the deal is that uh, around three years you work for the government, federal government, or state government, or the local government. That's kind of deal. So well, obviously the only program in the in the country where we actually give it to the PhD uh, students. So. is Will Marco. I'm with Burning Glass Technologies, which is a labor market analytics and software company. Uh, at Burning Glass, I oversee our research and consulting business focusing on the impact of emerging technologies on the workforce. And much of our work has focused on cybersecurity, been uh, focusing on it now for about six or seven years, uh, and do a considerable amount of research and work with uh, training providers, educators, um, employers, and policymakers who are all trying to figure out how to develop solutions to the cybersecurity talent shortage. Um, and as part of that, we've also partnered with an organization called CompTIA, which I'm sure many people here are familiar with, as well as the National Initiative for Cybersecurity Education to build something called cyberseek.org, uh, which is an interactive online portal that provides detailed supply and demand data about the cybersecurity workforce across the United States, uh, as well as a career pathway that maps out the specific roles across cybersecurity and shows how individuals can transition between them, adding the right skills and credentials along the way. And so all of the work that we've done, both at Burning Glass as well as through CyberSeek, is intended to help provide stakeholders in the cybersecurity community with more detailed information and actionable data about the cybersecurity workforce so that they can develop better solutions to the cybersecurity talent shortage. Very important, Jamie. Yeah, this is exciting because I'm going to be using all of your services and ideas in a little bit. <laughs> so my name is Jamie Wynott. I, um, I, I'm, I'm kind of straddling two worlds right now because I uh, have a new startup called Cyber Island, which is a managed service uh, solution provider near shore here in North America and a small island called Prince Edward Island in Canada. Um, I'll get into some of those advantages afterwards and, and, and where the way we're thinking um, from a personal perspective. Uh, I came to cyber from the business side, so I actually worked uh, for a large Canadian bank, um, managing a large sales group, um, enjoyed operations, didn't enjoy pre-2007 how much we drove people into debt, to be honest, and I had a, a come to myself moment where I decided I wanted to move more into how do we help the world a little bit more. So I worked more in, in, in program management and eventually made my way to cyber program management. Um, 
I've worked for a very large uh, asset management company as the global head of third party risk and then moved over to identity and access management. So I spent the last uh, several years in identity and access management as a, as a global head. So I've had a trial by fire <laughs> for the last uh, six years and have learned a lot about the, the technology and, and now very excited about this new startup that I'm creating, um, filling a labor gap um, for us in general, but specifically out of Canada, and we can get more into it as the, as the panel goes. Absolutely. And then Jamie and I have a great relationship right now. Very interesting that uh, you know he was my client. Now I'm going to be his client. <laughs> uh, so so uh, I think this panel shows the different levels of, or different layers of, of education system here, right? And uh, the incredible work that Chandra and Seema have done together at LaGuardia. Uh, community college has become literally a blueprint for CFF, and I wanted I wanted to dig into a little bit deeper as to you know what's the program and how you went about it. You had a pretty great journey last couple of years, so Charan, you know. Um, thank you. So essentially, our approach to workforce training is really industry informed, and as all of you referenced, right, it's really important that when we create a training program, it's aligned to what the industry expects and needs. Um, and the, the approach is also not just a technical training. Throughout the day, we heard about um, in communication skills, resilience, and ethics. So what we do is we incorporate all of those in the training program, and really what we call it is employability skills. I know it's called soft skills, but there's more than soft skills involved in it. So it's employability skills. What do you need in order to get a job, but also succeed in your job and keep the job? Uh, that is something we often see in our students is that they get very excited about entering the field and then it be, it be, we don't want them to be so challenged about navigating um, the industry, understanding how it works, that they don't, uh, you know, there is no retention. So retention is a big part of that. And another aspect that we build into our training program is experiential learning, really to um, how can we immerse the students in um, everything that we can do for them to understand how the industry works, uh, bring uh, guest lecturers into us. And someone had mentioned coaching here, uh, mentoring. It's a very important aspect of training programs because um, a lot of our students also have you, you may have heard of this is the imposter syndrome. They don't think they belong. They don't think they can be here. Uh, so again, uh, Seema referenced this earlier. It's really the non-traditional students, underrepresented and diverse population. How can we help them with this immersive learning process? And that also means anything ranging from, say, taking them to a job shadowing. Just how does this look? We want them to see themselves. Uh, can I work here? How will I feel working here? Two internship opportunities, mentoring, going to meetups, conferences. We would love for them to, you know, have opportunities where they come to uh, summits, conferences, and talk about what they do, what they have done, and so on. So that's a progression from the community college to the actual academic college, right? For so, degrees. definitely. Uh, I want to correct one thing. The previous panelist, I think Julie, I think she mentioned about the number of um, vacancies in cybersecurity. She said something like 50,000. It's actually 300,000. just in Georgia. Oh, just yeah, Georgia? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> good, good. Um, actually, uh, there right, are yeah. 300,000 position, vacant positions for cybersecurity professionals. I so, see correction coming up with Will, that number. <laughs> sure, sure. Uh, um, this, I didn't create this number, but I got it from um, uh, So uh, the, the reason I'm quoting this number is that um, there are uh, jobs available at every level, you know, just not you know, only one level. So many different kind of positions in cybersecurity available. So um, I'll give you some examples that how uh, actually so much demand even federal agencies, state agencies, um, you know, normally um, the federal agencies, they give you uh, something called band seven for if you are bachelors, band nine if you are masters, 
band 11 if you are PhD. Now, they're actually bumping up. And some of, many of my students, they got band 13, because, because it's all about demand and supply, right? Supply and demand. So, uh, so there is a lot of demand. So people who are young people here, the opportunities are unlimited. I think uh, there are jobs at every level. That's what I want to mention that. So we'll, thank you, Dr. Anto. Will you got uh, your data add on now? I, I always have the data add on, um, but I, I I think that both um, there's a kind of point that was kind of lurking beneath the surface. It wasn't explicitly called out in what you were mentioning, but I think uh, it, it was prevalent in both of your comments, and that is that behind the talent gap in cybersecurity, there has long been an information gap. And that has hindered efforts to try and build a cybersecurity workforce that aligns with the needs of the industry. And I think that there are really two primary reasons for that historically. Um, the first is that most of the data that training providers and other stakeholders had on the cybersecurity workforce for a long time was incomplete and very broad. Uh, most training providers had to rely on data from the Bureau of Labor Statistics and they track information security analysts, full stop. Newsflash, there are a lot of other cybersecurity jobs out there. Um, and it also provided very minimal information, if any information at all, about the kinds of skills and credentials that were in demand across the field. And so that kind of information wasn't very actionable if you were trying to build a cybersecurity program and train people for that field. The second issue is that there is just a breakdown of signaling in the cybersecurity space between employers and educators and individuals. So to give a concrete example of that, uh, many employers will ask for a CISSP because they think that's the credential you have to ask. And I think in most cases, the it's not the practitioners. They know whether they need a CISSP or not. HR who says, oh, yeah, we heard about this credential. We think we need to add it to this job description. And what that ends up doing is creating the scenario where we have more job openings requesting a CISSP in the United States than there are CSSP certified individuals in the entire country. And when we know that many of these jobs really don't need a CISSP, in fact, many of them, you actually logically cannot have a CISSP the way they're asking for it because they'll say, we want you to have CISSP and no more than two years of previous work experience. <laughs> Doesn't exist. Um, and so there, there were, uh, you know, there was a breakdown of the signaling between employers and the training providers who are trying to build uh, the next generation of cybersecurity workers. And so I think that uh, much of the work that you both were talking about and some of the work that you've been doing at LaGuardia is, is a great example of how you can, um, you know, comb combine both the quantitative aspect with the qualitative aspect of talking with practitioners to say, this is... Uh, how you have a more effective signaling mechanism in the field so that you can first understand what are the key skill sets and credentials and roles you need to be pre preparing people for in the field, and then taking that information and pairing it with conversations with stakeholders in the community to figure out, okay, now how do we uh, actually teach people those skills and then connect them with the people who are trying to hire them. Where we know where we have, you know, kind of, we think we have the understanding, but without this data, we can act, actually make those decisions, right? Where we invest, and that that gets us to Jamie in terms of like, you know, we, you started this program. Literally, this this gentleman is just uh, is just leaving a cushy job, not cushy, but but very very great, you know great job to go tackle something that is going to be extremely challenging. And and supply on the on the on the tail side, right of the of the businesses, and and I think it's an understatement that you talk about managed services. It's it's literally far you know greater than that. So talk about how do you get this demand signals, which in kind of um, which motivated to do what you do. Yeah, so so you're right. It's 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 a good risk, and I'm lucky to have a very supportive wife um, <laughs> as we move forward. Yeah. yeah. So so when I say that we're an early stage company. Um, I got a text this morning saying that the drywall was done and they're putting in the carpets to our, our 7,000 square foot space, <laughs> you know, kind of today. So that we're that early stage, but it's interesting because we're already having a lot of conversations with several of my CISO friends and also with vendors. So I'll talk a little bit about how we're looking at monetizing this, to be honest, all, all this, this data, right? Um, so from a CISO perspective, what we're doing is sitting down and talking to them about what their strategies are, where they're moving forward, 
and where they think that they, you know, have a capability now that they could add some bench strength. And then we're going to go out and actually build those teams. And I'll talk about that in a sec, how we're going to build those teams for them to add kind of a remote bench strength capability in Canada. Um, with the vendors, what we're having conversations with them around is that, you know, I, I buy vendor products and sign large managed service agreements, even with EY just this week. Um, <laughs> and we always talk about people process and technology, right? So we find technology solutions for a problem that we perceive that we have, right? Sometimes those vendors will come to us with a process kind of package, right? They'll come to us and say, okay, we can build these processes for you potentially in your system, or they'll give you a boilerplate that you have to go and figure out how it fits in your, in your system and, and, and the way that you're moving forward. But they don't really talk about people very much and help us with the operational tail on the other side. So when I have managers coming to me as, an, as a cyber executive, it drives me nuts when they don't talk about the total cost of ownership over a five-year period, right? Where they're coming in and saying, we knew we had this problem, we found this awesome vendor, it's gonna cost us $400,000 to bring this, to implement this and we'll have a support package. And it's like, well, who's gonna run this thing after we get all this new work, right? And it drives you absolutely insane, right? So I think there, there, there's a service line that vendors could be offering the market around supporting operations for a period of time. And as I'm talking to these vendors about this concept, they're very excited, right? Um, now I'll talk about kind of PEI, Prince Edward Island, which is this, uh, if you go to Maine and go over into the ocean and there's a little smile looking province, that's where I, I live. <laughs> you, you know, we have about 2 million people that come to a place where there's 150,000 uh, population in the summer because it's, it's just, it's an amazingly beautiful place. And in the winter, it's an ocean based uh, province. <laughs> I'll just leave it at that. But it's this beautiful, beautiful place. And we have kind of a, a couple of really neat options that are there. One is that we have a very high quality of life. Um, it, there's no crime to speak of. We, we have, because it's driven so much by tourism, we have incredible cultural opportunities. Um, we have amazing restaurants, all that kind of stuff like that. So we have this really high quality of life, but we have a very co low cost of living. Um, my house would cost $25 million in Toronto, and, and it's nowhere near even half a million, or around half a million. So it gives you a relative scale of, of how much we can actually pay people. Um, and we have people that are leaving the Toronto market to come to PEI and taking a 20 to 25% uh, pay cut in order to do that, just to have this greater quality of life. Um, I complain when I have more than the 10 minute commute and it's because, you know, a tractor got in front of me, kind of idea. So it's a very, you know, we have this really high quality of life. The other thing that's really interesting about our, our center, and I do say a boat, I'm Canadian. Um, the other thing that's really exciting about our, our, our center is that within a two and a half hour drive roughly, we have 10 universities and 15 community colleges. And the community college system in Canada is actually, uh, it's not a dirty word in Canada. They, it was originally this, the traditional trades, but they all offer some kind of computer science, whether it's straight, but it's all about going directly to market. Right? So they leave there and they can, you know, put switches together or whatever, right? It's very specific to a job description. So what I can do is actually build teams with them and we're talking about how do we break, particularly sort of our conversation style, the, uh, break the, um, how they look at on the job training. Because typically what they do is they'll do, they'll, you'll go to school until May and then you'll have two months of on the job training. And we all know when you bring an intern in for two months, you end up just creating a, a level of busy work for them or they're just running some little project or whatever. What we're looking at doing is they're actually changing, they're gonna add a cybersecurity degree at one of, the, uh, at one of the, the schools and they're gonna go Monday, Wednesday, Friday school, Tuesday, Thursday with industry, right? Whether that's us or otherwise. And this is what's amazing about PEI is that we had that conversation about two and a half weeks ago. I've already got a commitment that we're gonna be doing this because it's small and we can figure these things out. So sometimes you, the, the smallness is that strength. The other thing that's huge in Canada right now is that we have very aggressive immigration policies in bringing in immigrants with high skilled labor. And in Atlanta, Canada, that's, that's particularly true. Um, so to the point where as a designated employer, I'm actually able to bring in um, highly skilled individuals and I can apply for their work visa for them and have it within you know one to two weeks. 
once they come in, as long as I give them a two-year two job offer, um, they can have full Canadian citizenship in around, you know, six to 18 months, right? So, so we're able to build this really, you know, we can bring in the rock stars from away, right? Build teams from a, from a college university perspective, and we're able to pay them about 60% less, and they're happy to make that in any major market in Canada or in the, in the U.S. Um, so the opportunity is just so good that I am willing to leave a very cushy job where I live on the ocean. <laughs> so anyway, that's how we that's how we're looking at monetizing it. So actively looking for partners today. First movers are going to get better deals than everybody else in a couple of years. <laughs> All right. I, I think we'll come back to questions. Just give us a moment. Um, I, I, I want to kind of close the loop on these two sides because. I think when we are when we are looking for those demand signals that that motivated you to go and and open this center up, how how are you getting the data and and, and will to, how deep is the data uh, that is available in terms of like if you have to book, pay you know provide the talent or uh, supply chain, do you see technology oriented supply chain or uh, data that is coming in? Or are you seeing capability? I mean, what what are you seeing in in the the data that you're looking at? So in terms of the data we look at, I, mean, I guess I'll take the first question um, uh, and say term, the level of granularity that we're able to look at is is quite deep. In fact, you know, we often talk about the cybersecurity job market in terms of jobs, but we usually say it's more effective if you talk about it in terms of skills because you can call anybody an analyst and who knows what they're actually doing. Um, but once you start to unpack and say, okay, here's what the analyst is actually doing, here are the skills that they need, here are the tasks they're performing, you have a better sense of what's actually required in that job. And then you're also able to say, okay, where are their adjacencies between the skill sets that this person has and some of the other people out in the market? And once you build out that skill profile for all the different roles out there and all the different individuals, either within the market broadly or within an individual company, you can then start to say, okay, here's how we build a pipeline into cybersecurity from skill adjacent jobs where people already have 70, 80, 90% of the skills necessary to perform this role in cybersecurity. We just need to train them up in some of the last mile skills. And that doesn't take four years for somebody to earn a bachelor's degree. That can take four months and you're going to dramatically reduce the time to competency and, and make it much easier to bring people into the, the, into the field. And so I think that you know, having data at that level of granularity is, is very useful. And then I, I think that um, it's also useful to be able to see where there are differences across different geographies and across different industries. Because every industry is going to have different needs, every geography is going to have a different mix of requirements in their cybersecurity workforce. And so that's one of the things that we have uh, been doing with CyberSeq is CyberSeq allows you to drill down to an individual state or metro area and see what does the supply and demand look like for cybersecurity jobs in my region? What are the top jobs? Um, and we actually, I can announce this now, just a couple of weeks ago received um, a new grant to expand CyberSeq. And as part of that, we're going to be expanding the data on industries so that you can now drill down to individual industries in CyberSeq and see what the unique mix of job and skill requirements are. And so um, I think that, uh, again, just providing that, that level of granularity down to the skill level, thinking about jobs in terms of skills, uh, or thinking about the market in terms of skills and not jobs, and then also slicing it by the you know, location you're in, the industry you're in, things like that, is, is when the data really becomes actionable and you're able to make better decisions off of it. Uh, one thing I really want to emphasize on youngsters is that also the, the industry. Uh, one uh, skill that is very, very important is a self-learning skill. Uh, I think whatever we teach is good, but I think once they go to the real life, because I was there in the real industry for 15, 20 years, I worked through the, from the bottom most. Unless you are equipped, you are trained and are ready, prepared to do the self-learning, lifelong learning kind of thing, it's going to be very difficult because in security world, cyber security, you are going to work on unscripted and unknown environments several times or more, maybe most of the times. So in that environment, you should be able to do self-learning. 
And I think this is very important. Unless we teach how to do this kind of, how to kind of practice them in this world, um, that's one of the things I think they need the skills. Um, and kind of to follow up both on what both of you said, um, the data and you know, kind of lifelong learning, what we do when we put together training programs, and I think is very important, is that when you look at the data, and you know, kind of we take it back to our industry partners, and again, like you said, parse out the details. What are the competencies? What are the skill sets? We actually go ask them for job descriptions. We go to the hiring managers and say, we understand this is a job description, but when you say a person needs to do this, what do you mean by that? What do you mean what skills should they come with, not what's on that they should be doing? Which means when we train them, we are training them for the competencies versus the technique, not just the technical skills. So it kind of helps that process in looking at data and the training process. Sorry, I'm just going to jump on that. The, one of the things that I find, like the kind of barrier to entry for new folks, is they they may have a good technical background, and they actually say if you find a, a great technical business analyst, they think they still can't be a cybersecurity person because you have to have like a wizard hat and you do these special things, right? But you don't, they don't understand that they can actually transfer over very easily, right? And I think one of the places that we fail the most, to be honest, is in job descriptions, right? We create job descriptions that that make people not want to apply as opposed to creating things where at the end of the day, if you're going to say your hiring practice is that you only need 40% of the skill and you need 80% of the attitude and then we'll train the rest, right? If you have that mindset, well, you better try You, you got to write, you don't put, we're looking for ninjas and we're looking for you. Know, and then if you start thinking about it from a, from a gender and diversity perspective, even more so. Right? So if you start using this very masculine language in your job description, you know, we just read a Harvard study that, that when you look at, and I'm, I'm going to misquote it, but the, the gist of it was that most women feel that they need to have 95% of the skills inside of the job description in order to apply for the job, whereas guys are like, well, man, I got like 32%, so I'm good, right? <laughs> and that's so wrong, right? So what, how are we going to change how we kind of make the perception of these jobs as well, right? So I think the people that are moving towards gamification Right, um, you know that's we're going to be looking at that very seriously. Where we're just going to have a large account with net wars, and we're just going to ask kids in, in university to go out and try to get to level four. And if you do, then you know you get a job off on the day. You know we'll teach you how to speak to people, <laughs> you know, kind of thing. Yeah. But, but I think we need to think about. It. We just want to jump on that job description thing because I think that's a huge, that's a huge element of this. Yeah, because that's what that's what defines what you produce and what they uh, get, right? So. Yeah, I'd actually like to jump on that as well. One other piece of the, the job description issue is that we see employers are asking for heightened experience and education requirements, often when they either don't need them or in the past didn't even require them whatsoever. So, uh, for example, we see only about 15% of cybersecurity job openings say that they're willing to hire somebody with less than a bachelor's degree. Uh, about 30 to 40 percent of the existing workforce doesn't have a bachelor's degree. So something's changed, um, and I, I, I don't think it's the role. Um, so employers, when they when they send these signals and say, you know, you have to have at least an entry level, or at least, you know, three to five years of ex work experience, you have to have at least a bachelor's degree, then that's actually indirectly shooting themselves in the foot in many cases, because A, you are going to have to pay more for those people, B, they're going to be harder to find, because you're reducing your talent pool, and C, you're cutting off the entry level rung in the career ladder into cybersecurity. And so you're going to make it harder for you to fill jobs in the future because there are no more entry level opportunities to help build up the next generation of cybersecurity workers. And so I think that uh, employers, they need to you know, think about whether or not these uh, credentials are need to haves or nice to haves. And if they're just nice to have, then they need to understand how much harder it's going to be for them to uh, fill those roles and how much more costly it's going to be so that they can make an informed decision about whether or not they really should be asking for them. Yeah. Can we, can we expect that we would have some level of consistency in job description and where you can connect what you're providing in terms of building the, you know, the, the programs, whether it's a you know, vocational training or it's a degree program, 
and then Jamie knows what to hire. I'm just probably pie in the sky, but I, I really want us to do this, right? Jamie knows this is exactly what I'm looking. He can define the job description and will in his platform. Go to cyberseek.org, not now after 10 minutes, um, but he, you know, can, and, and will can find out and then tell the world that this is exactly what we need in terms of nice to have versus desired, right? So on that note, um, you, you have some closing comments, maybe just go around. For uh, one I point. want to do a uh, shameless uh, advertisement for students of community college as well as um, the university. Uh, I think a lot of students here are really smart kids. Um, so they would love to work for companies because there are a lot of people who already have companies here uh, as an intern, internship. Internship is very important for the students. So if you, uh, I know, I, I just have to give some throw numbers, that's why. Even for $15, $20, even less than that per hour, they are willing to actually come and work for you. Okay, so give them opportunity. And, and I think uh, if you need have people, let me know. Or, no, um, uh, or no. So I think there are, there are a lot of uh, smart kids there uh, that are prepared to work and learn. I think uh, industry should give also opportunities for internship or either in the summer or in the fall or spring, doesn't matter. Uh, I, think, I think it really greatly helps how they can move into from university to the industry environment. Okay. Quick closing thoughts, Shana. Sure, I'll just add something that kind of references to what you, it's also the building the bridge to higher education. Um, in the community colleges, especially in the non-traditional settings that, like, you know, in the non-credit side, when we do these kind of training programs, our goal is that our students are getting into the field, the tech field, but also we want them to pursue higher education. So we, we work with our credit side to build a memorandum of understandings internally and externally so that it's a win-win situation. They, they come to us, they get trained, they get a job, and then they come back and get their degree. So we want to be able to close the loop because that degree means a, a promotion and more opportunities. So it, it, we don't want it to be just where they come, they get a job, but we want them to kind of grow. It, it's not a job. I, I, sh I want to change the phrase. We, won't, we don't want them to get a job. We want them to have a career, and that means access to uh, higher education in the future. So um, I'm going to use a, a quote and help me understand, because uh, I'm based on my firsthand knowledge and like 15 years of experience in the cybersecurity field. Um, I have had job positions for cybersecurity that have no less than 20, sometimes over 100 applicants. And the other side of that is uh, in LinkedIn, I have multiple contacts who are in the cybersecurity, CISSP, CISM, CISAs, and two NSA certs kind of thing, who, you know, six eight months in a career search. So even though I, 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 you know, I get it and I've been in many conferences where this topic has been raised for over 10 years, when the rubber hits the road, I, what analytical data are you utilizing to show this huge gap? Because as a hiring manager, I've never seen a gap. And as an applicant, I've never seen a gap. So is there something that I'm missing or is it just that it's, you know, a, like I said, help me understand it because I'm not seeing it. I know that's counter to everybody in this room is like, what? So, so I, I think that one of the issues that <clears throat> people have to make when they're talking about the cybersecurity talent shortage is that they talk about it in very blanket and broad terms. And the reality is there are certain corners of the market that are going to be harder to fill or easier to fill than others. Um, so for example, one, one of the things that we look at sometimes when we are utilizing our data is we see, okay, how many existing workers are there who roughly match a particular profile somebody is asking for. And there are certain jobs where um, you can see that there are, you know, uh, you know, more than enough people. There can be, you know, it, it, the market average is you have a, at least five uh, currently employed individuals per opening. Um, the average for cybersecurity jobs in general is lower than that. It's about two to 2.5, but um, you do have some jobs that have more than the average, but then you also have some that are very low. So there are certain jobs within cybersecurity, um, many of which are requiring some of the you know, new and emerging skills or skills related to cloud security in particular that are uh, much harder to fill. 
Um, and we see that the, the time to fill goes up commensurate with the skill levels that people are asking for. And so, um, you know, I, I think that there are always going to be some cases where you have plenty of, plenty of people for a particular cybersecurity job, and then there are going to be some cases where you have, um, uh, you know, you're asking for certain competencies or skills where that's not the case. But in general, we do see that the cybersecurity workforce, based upon uh, supply and demand ratios we look at, when we look at the existing workforce, based upon the, the salary premiums, which are an indicator of hardness to fill, based upon just the time to fill, how long are these jobs remaining open, um, all signs point to cybersecurity facing one of the most severe talent shortages in the market because on all of those metrics, it is one of the, the worst performing. Um, and so I, I think that, um, you know, you can always find examples where, you know, there are some jobs that are easier or harder to fill um, and there are differences across the market. But, um, you know, in general, we do see that many of the, the cybersecurity roles, uh, based on all of the data that we see, um, are, you know, quantifiably um, pulling from a much smaller talent pool than other jobs. Is there some imperial data set, empirical data set we can, you guys could point us to on this subject? The answer is yes. Uh, the, the whole idea and the reason this panel got together was, uh, our pro you know, we had this in mind, but uh, the way I even found cybersec.org and real organization was, I was doing an article with Kate Fazzini for CNBC, and uh, the, the data is just not there. That's right. The data is just broad, too broad. Uh, right. 2.53 million dollar uh, million shortfall of cyber talent doesn't really mean anything. They're not going to be all cyber threat hunters, and maybe your job, your particular function is easier to fill. But if you look at the broader role that we're looking for, I mean, the, the whole understanding of cyber risk to a cyber policy definition to user controls and all that. So that's where cyberseek.org comes into picture, and they have that they have a substantial amount of data that you can actually look through, not just broadly saying 2.5 million shortfall. You know. I just wanted to add that we have been very successful in Europe, specifically in Finland and Germany. When we do, um, when we train uh, any smart industry, for example, like cyber uh, security uh, learners, we use smart learning environment and social micro learning and machine learning. So we analyze, we can see exactly what skills are there that each individual is lacking and all that. So we can take a lot of data and use our artificial intelligence to analyze either workforce training or uh, students that are, whether it is vocational learning or higher education or um, uh, any kind of training. So we use the smart learning environment and artificial intelligence to really go through that data and see that what skills have to be developed and who are the superstars among like 100,000 students. So. We have been very successful with that. And I just wanted to add, and also we have done a lot of exchanges between United States educational leaders as well as education policy leaders and business leaders and Finland, because Finland has been very successful in um, work, education and workforce development. And then engaging what we learned is that we have to bring more vocational training and respect for those institutions because not everybody have to go to um, higher education institutions. So we are working on that and we are using smart learning environments as well as AI to really understand that we make our decisions based on data. Okay, great. One more question. Okay. So yes, um, this question is, is for um, Chandana uh, with the Community College District. Um, one of the things we see in Texas is that if you look at Dallas ISD, which produces a very large number of students, one eighth of Texas graduates come out of DISD. Um, but when they are going through the community college system or attempting to go through it, oftentimes uh, they're not qualified to even go into community college level courses. They often are relegated to the um, remedial courses. So when you are designing your programs, and, and I guess this is for everybody as well, um, when you're talking about skills that are easier to obtain as opposed to maybe you know higher up the ladder, um, what critical basic skills do you think are uh, necessary uh, for somebody to be successful in your program? Um, because what we're finding coming out of the high schools, fortunately or unfortunately, mostly unfortunately, is that basic skills are lacking, basic problem solving, basic critical thinking, basic math, basic reading, basic writing. Um, so um, 
what is your experience with regard to those students who are entering the community college system but don't have some of those basic skills? Uh, that's a great question, and that's something we, we are very familiar with in, uh, within LaGuardia system as well as in all the other CUNY systems. Uh, one of the things we do offer is we, um, it's actually I think LaGuardia kind of pioneered this thing. We call it the iBEST model. What that really means is contextualized learning um, and bridge learning. So we take the technical training uh, to these students who need some remedial education. Uh, for example, um, let's say they, they want to enter the cybersecurity uh, basic training program, but they don't have the skills. So we would contextualize the, cyber, the foundational skills that they need, technical training, to um, some of the adult basic skills that they need to uh, learn so that it, they're not seen as two separate entities, but they're taught at the same time. So the technical instructor and the adult basic instructor or another combination that we see very often and we do is uh, the technical instructor and the English as a second language instructor will be in the class together and kind of working on that contextualized learning. And if it is just a question of not having some foundational skills, we also have what we call a bridge program where we give them those skill sets and then we bridge them into the training program. And we found that both of these models have been very successful uh, for our uh, students. 